Good morning everybody and welcome back to the Ultimate Fashion History where we are still on our vintage Egyptian adventure. And in this episode of our vintage Egyptian adventure, I invite you to come with us inside the tomb of Tutankhamun. But first, just a tiny bit of history. The story of Tutankhamun's tomb is the story of two men, one very young, one in his 40s, separated by 3,000 years, yet each of whose fame relied upon the other to such an extent that we would never have heard of one without the other, and tragically, both had far from happy lives. The first, a boy king, dying tragically young at the age of 19, we now think, because of the endless list of ailments and syndromes this young man was forced to endure because of the incessant and incestuous inbreathing demanded of Egyptian royal lineage. His pain must have been constant. The sheer number of walking sticks found in his famous tomb, suggestive of the difficulty he had walking due to his degenerative bone disease and a club foot. And that doesn't even take into account the idea we now have that he suffered from cognitive dis disabilities and epilepsy. Wow. The other, a bitter yet ambitious man in his late forties, a quick to temper loner whose incredible accomplishments were never recognized by his own nation within his lifetime. Contemporaneous sources suggesting he was secretly gay in an era when society was so cruel to people who were gay. Howard Carter would live only 16 years more after his great discovery alone and hard up, purloined treasures from Tutankhamun's tomb, discovered hidden all over his little London flat. He would never have heard of one without the other. First of all, Howard Carter was the only Egyptologist at the time who believed there was another pharaoh buried in the Valley of the Kings and that this king was called Tutankhamun basing his belief on a tiny fragment of cartouche he had discovered. And we would never have heard of Howard Carter had he not persevered year after year searching for the elusive tomb of a pharaoh who might not even exist, finally discovering in 1922 the tomb of the boy king. But Carter had been visiting Egypt since he himself was a boy of 17. Not scholastically gifted, or perhaps just a lazy student, the young Howard Carter was sent to Egypt to develop his one big talent. His talent as an artist. He was hired to draw, so that they could be recorded, tomb paintings and artifacts. And wasn't he great? I absolutely love his work. He also did some fantastic landscape paintings, which I am absolutely crazy about. As an artist, he really was the real deal, wasn't he? But Howard wanted to be an archeologist. He wanted to discover something, and he was lucky enough to find the perfect patron for his personal passion. Lovely Lord Carnarvon, who put up the bucks for Carter's digs year after year, decade after decade, and then finally he just couldn't afford to do it any longer, telling Carter that the 1922 season would have to be the last. That if he hadn't found this elusive tomb of a king that perhaps didn't even exist yet, he probably never would. So, a hundred years ago this year, Howard Carter knew it was basically the last chance saloon in the Valley of the Kings for him. According to our very knowledgeable guide in Egypt, Ahmed, Carter actually started digging at basically the entrance to Tutankhamun's tomb. But for some reason, he abandoned this idea and started digging around here. He kept digging in the same rough vicinity, but was getting nowhere year after year. He then absolutely convinced himself that the tomb of Tutankhamun lay here and started digging, which was a terrible idea because the rubble from the massive hole that was dug 
ended up covering the actual entrance to the tomb. Anyway, as Lord Carnarvon had given him his last chance, Carter returned to the original digging site, thinking, well, maybe it's here after all, but had to then excavate everything he himself had piled on top of it. But as we all know, in November 1922, his years of effort and self-belief finally paid off. He found the tomb of Tutankhamun, summoned Lord Carnarvon from England, the two men not allowed to break the seal to the tomb and go inside, until the Egyptian antiquities authorities arrived, but, unable to contain themselves, Carter carved a little sliver at the top of the door to peek in with candlelight. And when Lord Carnarvon asked him, do you see anything? He famously replied, yes wonderful things. And what wonderful things he did see. Gold upon gold upon gold, all of it crammed into this tiny little tomb. This was headline news around the world. The discovery of the tomb and all of the treasures it held. A genuine good news story, a feel-good story, in the wake of World War I and the pandemic of 1918, and we all know about pandemics now, don't we? And then, of course, there was the story of the curse of Tutankhamun's tomb, and at the time it was said that Lord Carnarvon himself was one of its victims, dying tragically in 1923 from blood poisoning brought about by an infected mosquito bite, a bite he'd received at... The Winter Palace Hotel in Luxor, Luxor, formerly known as Thebes, and where the very first exhibition of the treasures of Tutankhamun's tomb was held, and where Rupert and I stayed on our very first night in Egypt. I did a walkthrough as an episode in this series, and I'll leave a link to it in the description in case you missed it. But even my Egyptomania is nothing compared to the Egyptomania of the 1920s, all of it kicked off by Howard Carter's discovery. Egyptomania would impact everything, from architecture to advertising, from homeware to, of course, fashion, which is why I teach the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb and its impact on fashion in at least three of my courses to demonstrate that no, fashion is not an island, it's a response. In the 20s, Howard Carter's name became famous, synonymous with adventure, perseverance and the manifestation of dreams coming true, while the teenage boy he discovered a pharaoh who reigned for less than 10 years, mostly as a child, and who, compared to someone like Ramesses the Great, didn't really do that much. Well, he would become the most famous pharaoh of them all. And so much of his fame was generated by... The treasures that were buried with him. The gold, so much gold. So much gold, so many golden artifacts buried in a tomb that is honestly smaller than most people's living rooms you'll see in a minute when you see the clip I filmed. There are no treasures in the tomb today, of course. The vast majority, including his iconic masks, have been repatriated to Egypt and now live at the Grand Museum of Egypt in Cairo. But although I didn't get to see them when we were in Egypt, I'd already seen the treasures of Tutankhamun's tomb. Half a century ago, when, as a seven-year-old girl, I went on a school trip to the British Museum to see the first blockbuster museum exhibition of all time, The Treasures of Tutankhamun's Tomb. I vaguely remember the outing, but I can't recall if I saw his mummified body, because I certainly saw it in the clip I'm about to show you from his tomb. And as you probably already know, there were many layers to Tutankhamun's sarcophagus, sort of like Russian dolls. The final box revealing his mummified body, which was eventually unwrapped. And in 2007, it was returned to its original resting place, and I explain why in the clip. So it was with a lot of personal history and personal feelings 
that I approached the tomb of Tutankhamun. I mean, I've told the story in class, semester after semester, for the past 15 years. But also, I had that memory of seeing the exhibition all those years ago, and when I descended into the tomb. The experience also tapped into my feelings about children who spend their short lives in pain, my empathy for poor Howard Carter and how he spent the remainder of his life feeling, well, dissed, dying of a horrible disease himself. And then seeing Tutankhamun's body, the body of a teenage boy, made me feel so sad because I have a teenage boy, don't I? My 15-year-old stepson, George, who certainly acts like he's a boy king around here. And well, it was just a really special experience for me. And here it is. So, going into Tutankhamun's tomb, and Rupert just said they've enhanced the experience <laughs> with this area here. And so we're going to do it. Oh my goodness, this is Tutankhamun's tomb. Lots of steps going down, I'll meet you at the bottom. And here he is, Tutankhamun himself. On the centenary year of Howard Carter's discovery. He was only 19. He's a cute little guy with a little overbite. Incredible. Thank you. And I believe he's the only um, mummified pharaoh or remains in the Valley of the Kings. And they brought him back and put him in his tomb in honor of him and all the other kings, queens, and priests who were taken from their resting place to go into museums. I think they should bring them all back. We don't go around digging up medieval kings and putting them in museums, do we? And his tomb is tiny because it wasn't intended for him. It was intended for somebody much less important. But then he died young and so they buried him in it. And so this was it. This is what Howard Carter discovered and it was full of all of that gold. And I guess this was his sarcophagus, King Tutankhamun's sarcophagus. But what I really wanted to see were these baboons. The 12 baboons that I think represent the 12 hours of night. I love them. Well, because his tomb was so tiny and there were so many people who wanted to see it, and quite rightly, we couldn't spend much time there. But you know what? I really didn't want to. The whole experience just made me feel sort of sad somehow. Not least of all because, although the young king looks a bit worse for wear in his mummified state, through the new technology that's available to us today, scientists have been able to reconstruct his face to give us an idea of what this famous young pharaoh actually looked like. And it really brings him to life as a person, doesn't it? In fact, I think he looks quite a bit like a young Freddie Mercury. And science has also been able to reconstruct his body. And you can see that that is a body in pain. And this, this kid found it quite difficult to get around, I think. And so the whole experience made me feel quite sad. When I was in his tomb, a line from that Elton John song suddenly came to me. I would have liked to have known you, but you were just a kid. Your candle burned out long before your legend ever did. And in the case of Tutankhamun, Moon, that legend was long thousands and thousands of years, but there would have been no legend of Tutankhamun if it hadn't been for Howard Carter and his candle and his legend both burned out too soon. I mean, we all know who Howard Carter is, but I'd argue that while everybody knows the name King Tut, far fewer know the name Howard Carter. Only eight people attended his funeral when he died at age 64. And look how humble his grave at Putney Cemetery is. It's hardly the grave of somebody whose name only 16 years earlier was known and celebrated around the world. But what I think is very touching is that the inscription on his grave is taken from an artifact he found in Tutankhamun's tomb. 
This, the lotus chalice made of alabaster that Howard Carter always called the wishing cup. And I think it's incredibly touching that these two men, whose names and whose fame are forever linked, were sent on their journeys with the same words. May your spirit live. May you spend millions of years, you who love Thebes, sitting with your face to the north wind, your eyes beholding happiness. Thanks so much for watching. Bye for now.